Hello folks, here's seven lessons I've learned from my own web development failures. Now, I'm not talking about my career or a job or um, self-help or anything like that. I'm talking about technical failures, technical mistakes that I've made and actually a couple that I continue to make. And I'm going to give you the lessons that I've learned from that stuff. And here we go. All right, so the first um, technical failure that I'm going to list here is JavaScript frameworks. A couple of years ago, I invested a lot of time into learning about JavaScript frameworks. Things like Angular, um, even front-end frameworks like Foundation and Bootstrap and so on. And what I discovered eventually after spending probably the best part of a year in that world, what I discovered is that in actual fact, if you just use vanilla JavaScript, you can get the job done more quickly, more robustly, and with greater browser compatibility. So for example, um, here's a little example here. This is setting a local storage variable. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. With a name of John, and this is retrieving it with vanilla JavaScript. Now that's really simple to me and it works everywhere. You go check out your frameworks, <laughs> you know, React and all of that, and see how they do things like this. Um, I, I should say, I don't know React, so perhaps they do it with one character. The point is that time after time, my observation is that vanilla JavaScript is easier, it works better, you know, it's just more reliable and everything. And so JavaScript frameworks were a bad idea for me. And that was my lesson. You may disagree, but hey, that's just what I got from it. Next, MongoDB. Um, about three years ago, the web development community went crazy about NoSQL and how, uh, you know, people started talking about big data and we need to move away from relational tables. But one night about a year ago I was doing a live stream and I did a comparison of MongoDB versus MySQL and I did a comparison involving reading from tables that had millions of rows and doing massive batch inserts with both technologies and I was expecting MongoDB to be really really fast. What I discovered is that MySQL could keep up with it all the way and it was really embarrassing and the more I looked into it the more I discovered that MySQL is actually incredibly powerful. If you think that MySQL is rubbish or slow or anything, think again. It's actually really really great and I can tell you that I've never worked on a website that needed MongoDB or NoSQL. This was just a big, big diversion and that was a mistake. Lesson learned, MySQL is actually very good and out there in the business community, relational databases are still the way to go. All right, number three, uh, cookies. I have tutorials out there and I, that do this mistake and um, I have made this mistake a lot over the years. So let's imagine you're building a sign-in system, a member's website or something, right? And when somebody signs in, you're going to give them a cookie. And maybe the cookie's going to have a thing like um, username, you know? And maybe you're going to remember something like the level. And who knows what else, you know? Uh, who knows what else, okay? Let's put in some random stuff. And in the past, I used to write cookies that would store things like that, you know. And uh, sometimes I would en encrypt the cookies and I'd think I was being really, really clever. But of course, the whole thing is just a big, big security vulnerability, even with or without encryption. And this was a mistake. And so what I do these days is I use a thing that I call identifier cookies okay so instead of having all of this stuff in a cookie and I don't care if it's encrypted or not but instead of that I would have something like this 
Now, this is me just typing randomly, but I'd have a random string, and that would be the cookie. And this is not something that's going to decrypt and give away somebody's username or something. No, it's just a random string. And so when somebody comes back onto the site, this random string would be picked up cross-checked against a database table and from the database, the secure database table, then you would get the stuff like username and so on, you know? So the thing that I learned is that having pretty much any information on cookies is not a good idea for security. Instead, identifier cookies is a much safer and I think a more versatile way to go, you know? It actually simplifies the whole cookies business when you think about it. All right, next, um, user tables. Okay, so let's imagine you're building a website, a membership website, let's say. Now imagine you've got a table called members, right? And that's the name of the table. Well, typically, you might do something like this. ID, first name, last name, username, and so on, right? This might be how you structure a table. Maybe that's going to be an integer, you know, or whatever. Anyway, we've all done that loads of times. I've taught that, I've used that, and so on. It's actually a mistake. Well, maybe not a mis mistake might not be the word. It's not an ideal way to go. And the reason why is because there are a lot of clients who like to use things like um, social media plugins for logging in or, you know, we've all been on sites where it's like click here if you want to log in with Google and there are all sorts of third party libraries and all sorts out there and when you have table structures like this, you're going to run into problems when you do this because this is not particularly flexible and so with user tables, I'm going to be covering this in Speed Coding Academy, but my recommendation nowadays is to just simplify and have something like that. So that means that, you know, there are tons of different ways of logging people in. So let's say you've got System X, whatever it is. Well, you can have that with the first name and the last name and all of that stuff. You can have that going on here and then just link it up to the user ID and look at that. Now you've got a system that's really flexible and that you can very easily bolt on other login or authentication systems or whatever, you know. So user tables was a mistake and what I learned is that it's better to just move towards a really simple uh, user table. And in fact, maybe you would just want ID and to go back to identifier cookies, maybe something like that would be better. All right, so let's uh, move on from that. The next one is manually written table joins. I've lost a client over this. If you are uh, writing big long table joins and <laughs> going on Google and looking up the difference between this join and that join, it's, it's really a mistake. You're making life far too difficult. Uh, what you really want to do is get some software. I use Navicat and the idea is, I've just made an example, it just makes no sense, but the idea is that you can drag your tables in and you can basically just decide what you want, join the things and then have the app here or the software. You can even beautify the, the code and it will do the joins for you. Huge time saver and you'll make less mistakes. So manually writing table joins is an error. I would say use software and auto-generate those joins like I was just showing you. Okay, number six, naming conventions. So around about 2012, Ruby on Rails appeared and they started using plurals. So they would have a database table called books around about 2015, for reasons that I don't understand, the PHP community started leaning towards singular. Now I can see a few people going back towards plural again. Now can you see what's going on here? That's right, it's just a pointless cycle of bureaucracy. Uh, it doesn't 
uh, solve anything. It's it's just problematic, and I should have ignored those naming conventions. Another one is camel case. Um, I used snake case for a long time. I still do. So snake case goes like this. But recently, a lot of developers have started using camel case for reasons that I could go into. A uh, camel case is not good. I'm not a fan and it's inferior to snake case and the reason why it's inferior is because if you have let's say you're building an app for a call center and you've got a refer url okay when we use snake case the rules are very simple convert to lowercase don't use any strange characters and separate words with underscores that's it right but if you do the same thing in camel case well how does that work well you do a capital letter when you get to a new uh, word so what we're going to have is it going to be refer url or is it going to be refer url if you have an answer and you're shouting at the screen then you know more than me because all over javascript there are inconsistencies with things like document get element by id and then we'll have something like, um, you know, things like uh, inner HTML. Can you see how this is kind of all over the place? So camel case causes all sorts of inconsistencies. And the lesson learned, I should have just ignored the crowd and I should have stuck with what I know. Um, I, may, I might do a video on that in the future, actually. Finally, it's kind of a trivial one, but JavaScript calendars. And I'm speaking about date range pickers and time pickers and, you know, any kind of library that you've got a hold of, maybe for Bootstrap or something. Well, there are plenty of good calendars and things like that out there. But what I've found is, again, and it takes us right back to the first lesson, you're always better off just writing your own, you know? And um, one of my regrets is that the code generator that I've made does have date range pickers and time pickers and all sorts of pop-ups that get generated, but they use third-party libraries, and it bothers me. I think it was a mistake. The reason why it was a mistake, well, there's a, a whole bunch, but one of the reasons is that all of the third-party libraries I've checked out, all of them have too much code. Uh, they have unnecessarily high amounts of code. They're overcomplicated. And remember, every third-party library that you use has got its own uh, rewrite cycle or versioning cycle going on. It's got its own politics and issues and all sorts. There might even be licensing issues. Now that I'm saying we should, um, you know, grudge paying a license fee, but you don't want to get into trouble and, well, quite frankly, you don't want to even get entangled in all of that. And I just think that, you know, uh, if I could turn back the clock, I would rather just use my own stuff. And that's one of the things that I'd like to do at some point in the near future. Maybe I'll fix that and, you know, start writing my own stuff. Um, in fact, that would be a good tutorial for YouTube. All right. Thanks for listening. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate you. And please leave a comment below. I love it when they leave comments.